I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. Today we're going to be talking about a report that the World Health Organization came out with, uh, which is talking about the ten biggest challenges to global health uh, in the years to come. And while I was going through the list, the thing that I found extremely striking was just how applicable a lot of these are to the Indian context. And quite interestingly, most of the stock photos used to illustrate them featured Indian actors, which I think um, really underscores the fact that India is going to be the place where where a lot of work is going to have to be put in to kind of face the health challenges that are coming up. Um, so, of course, to join me today, I have with me Dr. Shambhavi Nayak. Um, Shambhavi, let's just talk a little bit broadly about uh, what are the challenges that the WHO has identified and then maybe you can move on to how they affect India and what India might be able to do about them. Right. So, I found the challenges to be pretty interesting. Some, I think, I would have figured like, when you talk about health, like global health challenges, I think anyone thinks of Ebola, like the first thing that comes to people's head is like this terrifying uh, disease that has been causing considerable havoc in Africa. Mm. Uh, but there are more things which are of a less uh, grave nature, but are steadily taking their toll on human productivity and health, even in India. Uh, so even uh, when we look at the 10 uh, broad uh, threats that the WHO came up with this year, uh, many of them are diseases of particular interest. So Ebola actually features on that list. Uh, what the WHO had done separately from this list was come up with uh, 10, uh, they call it blueprint diseases. The idea is that we know very little of these diseases and so we need to do uh, research and development. Uh, we need to build infrastructure to actually even gauge these diseases. Um, Ebola was one of them. Uh, the other one, which are very familiar to us, is Nipah. Uh, so this list actually came out before uh, the incident in Kerala uh, and um, subsequently WHO has focused on understanding Nipah better. That's quite interesting. Let, let, let's just take a quick detour here because you actually worked on with, with the people who tackled this problem mm -hmm. on the ground, right? How did they go about building this blueprint from the beginning as it were? I mean, the, the diagnosis of Nipah was in our case... Um, extremely uh, lucky and the fact that it happened in Kerala and the Kerala state government took a lot of rapid steps uh, to contain it. So like you said, I had the fortune of then interviewing some of the key players who were involved in that response. And from what we understand is that A, you need rapid response. You need to keep your mind calm and try to identify uh, what the disease is. Um, about 50% of fevers uh, of fever-related diseases in India currently go undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So we know fever as a symptom, but we don't know what has caused that disease. So what happened was that after two days of not mm -hmm. figuring out what the disease was uh, and ruling out a number of the common infectious agents, the doctor sent a sample to Manipal Cancer, Manipal Virus Cancer Center, uh, where there was a kit for Nipah, uh, a diagnosis kit. The scientists there tried it out and figured that it was actually Nipah, which was unusual because Nipah has not happened in Kerala before. It is uh, endemic to Bangladesh and parts of West Bengal, but it has never traveled that far down. Uh, so it was a new thing for us. There was also this very nice documentary uh, on uh, on the whole Nipah incident. I think it's on Netflix. It is uh, in Malayalam, but um, there are English subtitles. And they also talk about how they first uh, were skeptical about whether this was a bioweapons attack and that they had to actually do an epidemiological study, which is basically to figure out how each patient might have got the disease, if they had contact with the other patient or not. Because if there was even one person who had got it without interacting with the first person who had got uh, the Nipah virus, uh, then they would have to figure out where he got it from and if there was actually some uh, intentional planting of the disease uh, in, in people. So it, it is a very interesting uh, story about how, because when it, when it first happens, you don't really know where it has come from. Hmm. And that can cause chaos, that can throw your healthcare response out of routine. So 
it it is quite interesting it's fascinating i mean it's it sounds like we got quite lucky with being able to contain nepa at the level that we were that lucky but we learned reactions very quickly so what happened after that was uh, the state government actually put in a lot of money in purchasing diagnostic kits from private players uh, and there was a second incident this year but because they had a diagnostic kit present Hmm. at the primary healthcare center they could quickly respond quarantine and not a single other person got infected they had that at the so, primary healthcare yeah so it was it was it is pretty cool so we are learning we are evolving i think that's one of the reasons why this list of threats is important because hmm. it shows us directions in which we can best put in our resources so we've talked about like the the blueprint disease but of course i mean they're just one part of a yeah. much much bigger yeah. spectrum of diseases right yeah. so can you tell us a bit more about that uh, so the other ones i think uh, people are pretty familiar with this flu and this dengue Uh, flu, I I find it quite surprising because when I studied in the UK, every year we used to get vaccines. So flu se- uh, vaccines change per season, uh, and our workplace used to actually pay for our vaccinations because they did not want people to go down with flu. We don't see that in India so often because I think it's okay for us to lose a couple of uh, days, and that attitude needs to change because as flu keeps on evolving, it keeps on getting more and more dangerous, uh, and at some point of time, it might. St- Stop being just oh it's uh, I've been down for a week to dying so um, I think that attitude of us need to change as when it comes to flu um, or even dengue dengue there are a lot of efforts going on uh, this effort at the National Center for Biological Sciences here in Bangalore to create a vaccine based on Indian data ICMR is also uh, working on a vaccine. Uh, that it has got uh, a tech transfer done from the NIH in the US. So the NIH has developed a vaccine. They're doing a tech transfer, and the ICMR will develop an Indian variant. So there are efforts being made to create vaccines uh, yeah. for both of those. And then there's HIV. HIV is actually making a comeback in India. HIV for a long time people were skeptical about HIV. Then we had really good when we found the retrovirals. Um, we managed to curb the uh, epidemic quite a bit. But now HIV is becoming resistant. to the medicines that are already present and this is data that i have heard about uh, but it is not publicly uh, publicized so much uh, so there is going to be this epidemic that might come in the next 2 or 3 years uh, that we are very unaware of or not trying to do much about at least so i have a friend who works in this space hmm. whose primary job is to find drug resistant hiv cases so um This is basically because the virus is mutating in response to whatever we can find to kill it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Viruses are very clever that way. So even in even for example malaria, um, so in Africa there's a very high malaria uh, incidence, and uh, they develop diagnostic kits to pick up malaria, hmm. right? So you just have to put your blood in there, and I think in like an hour or so you would get whether it's malaria positive or negative. And the idea was or the kit was that it used to pick up a small part of the shell. of the pathogen and what they found after a couple of years was the the malaria mutated to lose that particular part right hmm. i mean this is darwinism yeah we we literally selected yeah. for that yeah. effect uh so uh and so the diagnostic test failed and for a brief time people thought that malaria cases had gone down <laughs> because they were not detecting malaria oh. right wow okay uh, but yeah that so, was not the case so now they have figured out other ways of diagnosing So uh, and diseases don't necessarily also have to be uh, transmitted by pathogens, right? I mean, there's this whole other yeah, yeah epidemic that's happening. Yeah, non-communicable diseases as well. Hmm. Mental illnesses, for example, being I think something that we that India needs to have a much much deeper conversation about. Uh, you look at the look at suicides happening in all of our students, uh, which is particularly bad. Uh, physical inactivity uh, also leads to obesity and a host of associated diseases. Those are going up. I think as people age more or live longer lives. We see a lot of non-communicable diseases coming up, but at the same time, even with infectious diseases, we are seeing a lot of resistance to uh, antibiotics. For example, again, we are to be blamed for this because we have used antibiotics at every nook and corner. You know, you, you feel as if you are going to sneeze tomorrow, and you start an antibiotic dose. Uh, you put antibiotics in soap. Uh, all of the uh, cows who, who we milk give anti uh, give them an antibiotics so that they don't fall ill. Yeah, and so this I rampant think... use of antibiotics has caused superbugs to be formed. It also like I mean piles up as you go higher up the food chain, right? Yeah. So like if if you if you if you if you're eating a chicken that's been fed on antibiotics and you eat like five or six of them, you're going to have a lot more antibiotics in you, and so the pathogens you get are going to be resistant to like that cocktail of antibiotics, which makes them all the more effective at resisting yeah. all this. 
it's actually very interesting to see how after like a couple of decades of like extreme optimism about the indian healthcare system and and though there are still causes to be optimistic uh um, the things that helped us like overcome a lot of the challenges especially the easy availability of antibiotics seems to be coming back to bite us in the in the rear in a much more massive mm-hmm. form right is there anything that we can do to combat super i mean bugs? this is evolution i mean there's at the heart of it this is just uh us learning after 20 years oh darwin said this <laughs> darwin was right all along <laughs> yeah we should have just listened to him yeah. uh and should have been able to at least predict certain uh if not all of these effects but i think at that point of time it was possibly low hanging fruit then it was necessary to take the steps that we did I to agree. improve healthcare in a bit but i think now we are in a much better position to understand the efforts and mitigate uh, the ill effects that are going to happen because of that the problem is if no if we are still not learning to one thing that we sort of, definitely don't seem to be learning is how to combat environmental problems yeah. like Air pollution. Air pollution. Air pollution is actually number one on that list. <laughs> <laughs> you see this picture and think this is this Delhi? Uh, <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. Incidentally, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it baffles me that every year we seem to have this conversation and still have not been able to understand what can be done about it. Interestingly, when that came out, I mean, one of the roots of the air pollution is in um, is in the Green Revolution. How was that? Uh, so. So when green revolution came obviously we needed that we we did not have enough food uh, for our country and hmm. the green revolution made us into a food surplus economy but basically we went from having these long stem rice and wheat to short stem so dwarf rice and wheat varieties hmm. um the long stem ones cattle can eat so the stubble that is left over cattle could eat now they can't hmm and so all of that stubble needs to be burnt because we don't know what to do about it <laughs> and wow, that okay. actually is a significant portion so that's where the stubble burning the things come from okay yeah. i mean I, i knew the stubble was causing what i know it was yeah. actually tied to the green revolution in that sense yeah okay so clearly we are not uh, really thinking about air pollution in like a very long term sense um but what about let's 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 come back to the to the question of like pathogens and stuff like that how do you uh, and especially since you mentioned that kerala had nipa kits in primary healthcare centers is primary healthcare something that the world is doing a good job at are we able to deliver uh, the kind of care that people need uh, at the most granular level so well the world is a big place uh, <laughs> there are countries which are doing it far better than we are I think in an Indian context, we are particularly doing a really bad job. A bad job. Yeah. So I mean, Kerala is uh, the exception. Kerala is likely the exception hmm. uh, because also a lot of states control over um, hospitals and primary health care units. It varies according to states. Some do do better. Uh, I think Kerala, for example, also uh, has the highest uh, spend per state of on health care. Um, so in that ways, we do need to do a lot more. um for example if you just take a look uh, just take the example of karnataka again we have had the kainasur um fever which is a monkey or so it's it's fever that is spread by monkeys it happens in north karnataka goa has been happening for years uh, but we still ha- have not taken a lot of steps to stop it so it happens again same as nipa um, if the monkey eats a fruit and if you eat that fruit it can spread and this particular I, i found i found it very surprising so i'd gone to my village which is as you know um, in uh, on the maharashtra goa border and uh, i was we have this big chiku tree in my uh, house they also have mango trees just saying yeah <laughs> so uh, i wanted to get a few chikus to bring home uh, and uh, one of my neighbors was helping me um and he found a, a, a couple that were clearly eaten by bats or something on one side and i was like tossing them away And I was like, "Why are you talking them away? They're good fruits." And he started eating them. He uh, ate them. Yeah, and I was like, "Well, no." Wow. So I had to sit him down and talk to him about Nipa and about how these things uh, spread. But there is a lack of awareness on how this actually happens. And I think that is one of some places that health can can help because even preventing these diseases has to be part of a good primary health care system. Hmm. So, for example, in Bangladesh, they have very clear guidelines on Nipa. because they see it every season um and one of their objectives is to educate people on what to be what is to be done to prevent nipa uh and i think we need those kind of measures to be put in into our healthcare system as well it's not just treating a disease it's how to stop it to begin with literally nip the problem in the bud yeah 
um so primary healthcare workers i assume play a massive role mm-hmm. in like educating people about this kind of stuff yeah but we we are, i mean we are very poor so my village uh, for example has about 600 people like spread throughout but our nearest healthcare center is about 10 kilometers away mm. and only one doctor does like visits to the village which is pretty scary it is i mean It 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 sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Like, what if your neighbor happened to get Nipah that day? Yeah. And um, so so the issue is is it's multi dimensional. Not only do primary health care centers um not do enough work in terms of communication and prevention, but very often they're not close enough to population centers. Yeah. Uh, we don't have enough doctors. No, our infrastructure is particularly poor. And- So, just in terms of diagnosis, having diagnostic kits, something that we see very often in uh, particular in villages is uh, snake bites, right? Hmm. And where is the uh, uh, the anti venom kept, and how soon can you get to the anti venom? So, those problems are, are pretty thick. So, yeah, we see them throughout. Is it something that you see the government um, investing in? Like, is is the union government at all concerned about this? Are you aware of any common programs that? Aim to shake up the way primary healthcare is delivered in India. To be honest, I really don't know. I mean, we do need a sh- we do need a shake up. Hmm. We do need more funding going to these centers. I think currently it is only about two percent of GDP that goes into looking after healthcare, which is pretty low. Uh, we do need to have better network primary healthcare centers. We need to have we need them to have better equipment, uh, more infrastructure. I was talking to this company that uh, makes these diagnosis kits uh, for a lot of these viral diseases. You have to to a technique which the 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 primary equipment is pretty expensive so they have been creating these indian versions uh which are cheaper and what they were telling me was that one of the primary issues that we face is training and so we want to create a program where there is least input given by the the person who is in the primary healthcare center Because they just don't have the training to maybe even take a blood sample to put it correctly, to handle it correctly, to be able to uh, then analyze it correctly, and we do not have capacity to be training all the all in the number of individuals that we need currently. So they're trying to uh, now bring down the level of the equipment that they do to make it so simple that anybody who's trained maybe at twelfth standard or has some basic training can actually use that equipment for diagnosis. Desperate so, times call for desperate measures, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we haven't even like touched upon. aspirational stuff like the sustainable development goals and all that like mm-hmm. maternal mortality infant mortality I'm assuming is as bad as it's been and yeah, in fact india has improved quite a bit in but india. i mean fair enough but i mean in comparison to most of our neighbors i think in mm-hmm. south asia we are yeah. we are just not doing very well which is quite yeah. surprising considering the size of our economy and so on and so forth yeah yeah um okay fair enough uh, but i think coming to um, possibly the biggest one of the biggest threats uh that we're going to face in the, in the coming decades is this um this new trend of believing that vaccines are unhealthy somehow yeah there's a big vaccine hesitancy tribe that has been taking over the world why is this happening i i genuinely do not understand i mean a lot of this i think came out of some misleading reports uh which were funded by uh the pharma industry so obviously one of the biggest casualties of the vaccine industry is the pharma industry hmm. because if you prevent a disease why would you, you need medicines for drugs, it? Yeah. and so a lot of the big pharma funded studies to basically rubbish the vaccine movement and i think that sold a lot of seeds in people's mind that maybe um, vaccinations are not good for you uh interestingly the who had this very nice data set which showed about how vaccines currently the only rival to vaccines in providing healthcare is clean water so like access to clean water yeah wow so after access to clean water the second thing that that actually gives a uh, great healthcare outcomes is vaccines that is actually quite interesting you mentioned that because i happened to be um, looking at some um, I, th- i think it was who data last week and it turns out that i think india has a has nearly 77 million people who don't have access to clean water mm. and the number for drinking water is about 163 million that's the population of russia man wow and i mean just just to give our listeners a, a sense of the sheer scale of the problem we're facing yeah. Um, there was this report uh, done on uh, metros, right? Which drinking water that comes in taps is actually portable, huh. and the only one that does that is Mumbai. Mumbai. Yeah. Wow. Then that's. Oh my God! I was thinking like the, the the proportion of India's population 
that actually has reliable access in a metro to drinkable water out of their taps. That's tiny. It's, it's yeah. So this vaccine hesitancy thing has been uh, going around and get, gathering strength for a while now. We have seen a couple of big moments in Kerala over the past two years, uh, which is very surprising given their healthcare expenditure and things. But it is really scary about why we are not. And India is uh, the world's biggest vaccine producer. Uh, but our market for vaccines and the idea of taking vaccines seems to kind of scare us a bit. Uh, and that is going to need changing um, because vaccines are the most cost effective way for us to improve healthcare outcomes. Uh, and if we cannot do that, if our population stays away from taking vaccines, then we just see more healthcare costs. Uh, there was a study which showed, I think, 55 million um, Indians are pushed into poverty every year because of healthcare budgets. 55 million. 55 million. And, you know, we, we talk about a lot of these measures uh, to help people come out of poverty. But we never think of healthcare as something that pushes people into poverty and hence should be prioritized. Um, and the opportunity cost of that is never calculated in our GDP or in anything that we do, right? So mm. um, I think that is something that really needs to change. Uh, the, our approach to looking at improved uh, human productivity uh, requires a revisit. So interesting on vaccine hesitation, nothing to do with healthcare. You know what the other uh, movement that is catching up? Flat earthers. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Well, so it seems like a general anti-science thing, right? That yeah. you know, science is fake. Let's just go back to our roots, which we learn about on Facebook groups. <laughs> um, so it's, it's quite interesting you mentioned that opportunity cost point, actually, because I think that once you factor in the amount of time that people in, for example, um, smaller population centers in rural India have to spend to bring their relatives to a place where they can get health care. They might have to go to cities. The amount of time they have to spend on collecting funds and so on and so forth is just a massive, massive drag on not only the healthcare system, but also just broadly the Indian economy. Uh, these are people who could potentially be living full, productive, happy lives, going yeah. to their jobs, studying, becoming, I don't know, healthcare workers. But instead, they're essentially caught up in the cogs of this government machinery that doesn't see healthcare as something that's really worth spending on. Yeah, and even those who are currently in the system, right, our, our policies towards healthcare are so risk averse, hmm. right? If you want to look at like research and development policies for, for creating those same drugs, vaccines, no one wants to take the risk with something that is um, not 100% safe. And we're doing research. You never know when something is 100% safe. You have to trial it at some point of time. But this is the way the policy are framed. Um, there is absolutely no way of knowing which drug might get approval when. So we see very poor investment going into the pharma sector or the biotech sector in India just because they don't know whether they'll get their money back or not. So like private investors um, who fund, a, but I think in the US it's 50-50%, the government funds 50% R&D, private investment funds 50%. Can, can and, you just explain that a little bit? So let's say that... Um, Pharma company A wants to research a new drug. Hmm. Does the government fund have the cost of that? Is that how it no, works? No, so the, uh, if you look at the total uh, research and development that huh. happens in the US uh, across private and academic laboratories, it's roughly, uh, it's half, roughly and half and half. Hmm. In India, majority of research and development, uh, like the basic fundamental science is supported by um, the government. The, so if you look at biotech startups in say Bangalore, huh. right, they apply for government grants, which are about like 50 lakhs or maybe a crore. That's which is Yeah, exactly. Uh, you really want to have those venture capitalists coming in and saying that, no, we will give you 100 crores, 150 crores or whatever. But we don't see that happening quite a bit, mainly because there's a lot of ambiguity in the regulatory landscape. You don't know what will get approved and what will not. So that that significantly needs to change. And is this is the government a, a necessarily a reliable funder of fundamental R and D? Because keeping in mind the same government that started the Ministry of Ayush, uh, which is promoting homeopathy as as an actual alternative medical practice. Actually, let's talk about that a bit. Do you see mm -hmm. homeopathy as as a potential threat to India's healthcare system? To be honest, um, I am a little divided on homeopathy. Okay. okay. As a child, my my parents did give me homeopathic treatments. I don't know if they worked or not, but I am a healthy child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are. So, having said that, I think what we have not been able to achieve, uh, and not just with homeopathy, even with Ayurveda and other traditional forms of Indian medicine, is subject them to scientific rigor that the West has come to accept hmm. and apply to to allopathy. Hmm. Okay, I think we do need to do those, do those studies 
before we either accept or reject completely those schools of medicine. I mean, if the data shows that this does not work in an Indian setup, it does not work. Then there is no counter argument to it. Sure, but I mean, I, do, I just don't like the idea that taxpayer money is being used to fund this 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 hairbrained ex, like I, I, exercise when we know that there are these good allopathic practices that are available to us and that we could we have the technology to make it cheaper and more accessible right now. I think the question is whether we should do a comparison between allopathy hmm. and other other methods because at the end of the day, allopathy is tries I think is best to cure a symptom, hmm. not the disease. And what the other systems claim is that we are going after the the root cause of the disease. Without without attacking pathogens? So they will attack the pathogens. So for example, paracetamol. If you take paracetamol, right? Hmm. Uh, its basic function is to bring down your fever. Hmm. It is not going after the pathogen. Hmm. Whereas in Ayurveda, what the idea is that we'll figure out what the pathogen is, we'll go after that, not after the symptom. Uh, this is going to sound ignorant because like I know that Ayurveda like is a thing and that it has worked for people, but I'm I'm just a little cynical about the idea that Ayurveda attacks the pathogen because I'm I'm thinking like in terms of like antibiotics, right? Antibiotics do actually target mm, the yeah. pathogen in question. Yeah. I, how does Ayurveda do that? So what I, from what I understand of Ayurveda, because you look at the prakriti, uh, the idea is that are you more predisposed to certain diseases mm. because of the way your prakriti is, mm. and whether we can change your prakriti to bring it to a more significant balance so that you get less predisposed. Is what, what is, I think is happens with Ayurveda. What I'm saying is that we don't know huh. whether this is correct or not correct. Well, and, I, I, I'm, I'm saying if, if Baba Ramdev and Patanjali wants to fund a study into this, great for them, let them do it. If they can do a scientific thing that is going to convince the West, wonderful. They can sell a lot of, they can make, they can sell a lot of these Ayurvedic drugs, great for them. But the idea that the Sent the union government is spending money Adirut, on this. No, I think Anirudh, what we what we forget is the fact that a lot of people huh. uh, who are not in our circles huh. actually depend on Ayurveda and homeopathy uh. Uh, to take medicine. And I don't think it would be fair to uh, just impose allopathy on them because there will be some resistance. So if you think about it, my in-laws hmm. will take allopathy as a last resort. As a last resort. As a last resort, they okay. will they will choose not to put chemicals in their body. They will say, "I'll try Ayurveda." First, I'll try some home remedies first. I'll try homeopathy first and then I'll go do allopathy. And I don't think that imposing allopathy on them would work, right? They'll be like, nah, I'll just try it out. That seems dangerous to me, right? Because like, what if you have Nipa and you're like, look, let me just, uh, I don't know, eat, eat Chavan Prash and I'll be okay. Like, it's it seems like you're I endangering you're, a lot of other people. I think you're simplifying it. I, I, think, am, I am yeah. simplifying, but I'm, I'm just saying... I can see a a, a a a situation where if the government is funding this and trying to establish that it's an alternative medical practice, it's without, a medical practice without it's a medical practice without actually having the concrete scientific basis to say that it is pretty risky considering all the other challenges that India is. Yeah, I'm saying face. that we need to establish that scientific rigor. Hmm. If we can subject these traditional systems to scientific rigor, and we have to figure out what that rigor is. Hmm. Because I don't think we can take straight away what whatever allopathy standards are and say that this is what Ayurveda should also do. Hmm. I don't think this that will work. We'll have to figure out what those standards are that Ayurveda needs to show. Right? What kind of trials need to be done to figure out hmm. uh, whether this actually works or not. Yeah. And if it does, then how do we even start regulating it? Okay, all I'm saying is the we who should be doing that research should not be funded by my tax money. I don't have that much money. I don't mind, I don't mind so. <laughs> my tax money. Primarily because I think that a lot of Indians continue to use these use these systems uh, so. to act. And we probably have a better um, network of these systems than we have of allopathy. That was my um, follow-up question. Yeah. So th- that's, that's one potential way, I suppose, that I could think of Ayurveda as not something that's totally harmful. But again, the biggest question for me is, if we have limited resources as a poor country, we know that uh, superbugs are a thing. Uh, we know that Nipa is a thing. We know Ebola is a thing. I mean, all these challenges are there. Should we not be trying to work harder at kind of integrating this existing kind of homegrown network with modern medical practice? I'm not saying force people to take allopathic stuff. All I'm saying is, if there are more Ayurveda centers than there are primary healthcare centers run by the government... Is there potentially a way where Ayurvedic practitioners could, I don't know, be required to to also like stock allopathic medicines 
there was a so there's a bill that was coming um, over for the for homeopathic practitioners to do that hmm. to be able to prescribe allopathic medicines as well uh, and that's actually a great thought i think we need some cross talk between all of the systems of medicines that we have because i think finally at the end of the day it is the human body and i think perhaps resistance has come for because they've always worked in silos hmm. um and maybe because people like you are like ah your alternate you don't work i'm not going right? to deny that like uh, th- there is so, definitely an orientalist angle to the yeah. whole discussion so i think we need i think i think we need to be a little more open minded about what we can do how how best we can use the network that we currently have i think more than uh, stocking allopathic medicines i think maybe if uh, we maybe if our traditional healers are able to uh, appropriate some of the scientific principles that have gone into uh creating the allopathic medicines hmm. uh, just does if i give person a this medicine versus placebo does this medicine work or not if we can bring in some of that uh into traditional healing uh that in itself might make things easier for us so it's it's a two sided process you need, you need to have um modern doctors speaking to traditional practitioners because the end result of both these people not talking to each other is that Mm-hmm. poor like or just generally citizens end up dying yeah um and then there's of course the broader question of just investing in stuff like access to vaccines or access to freaking clean water yeah um and maybe spending a little less money on advertising that you've given clean water to every village in the country and actually delivering that clean water we have digressed a bit from the topic yeah. but uh, this is a very interesting conversation thank yeah. you so much for joining me shambhavi uh, Thanks, can you tell our uh, audience your twitter handle please yes you can follow me at the night mike I am open to trolling. <laughs> and I am at A K A N I S E T T I. Trolls will be blocked. Thank you so much for joining us on All Things Policy. Thank you, Anil. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at @takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the week, Storytel and Intel. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. On Golgappa, host Tripti is joined by Girija Godbole. She speaks about how acting and theater shaped her as a person. On the Empowering series, Zarina is in conversation with the host of Top Retail's Madhuri Adwani. They talk about storytelling and ongoing issues in our country from CAA, NRC, and protests. On the Habit Coach, Ashton talks about the fear of failure and how it's fine to fail. The Simplified Gang is back with the last part to their 2019 recap. Join Chuck Narayan and Tony as they talk about Amazon, Brexit, and Gully Boy. On Pulia Bazi, Pranay and Saurabh discuss the future of electric vehicles in India with Rahul Raj, co-founder of Inverted, an energy storage company. Thanks and keep listening. Do you wish you were smarter? Well, so do we. But the next best thing, we could make you sound smarter. And to help you with this endeavor, we are Simplified, Ooh. a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a uh, little knowledge, a lot of poor jokes, and a ton of random trivia. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. See ya. See ya.